chapter 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to, him, to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither ne corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty. Order the decree you have put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went out as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up. He hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted his God. At the king's command... The men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all nations and people of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. And he endures forever. 
His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, but good morning, church. How are you? Yeah, good. A few of you are well, I see. Some are still asleep. Uh, if you haven't met me, Andy's already told you that my name is Josh, and I am honored, as always, to be up here this morning. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a teacher. Uh, I serve on the board here at Warmbra. I work with the teenagers on Friday nights. Uh, and the best for last, I'm married to my lovely wife, Jessie, and I have three kids. Uh, so who has loved uh, the Daniel series thus far? Any hands out there? Who's loved the Daniel series? A few of you? Yeah? Oh, man. We've got to do better at this, I guess. Uh, well, let me say if you're new and maybe you've missed some of the talks, you've got to go. Oh, that's better. You've got to go online and catch up. Man, God has been teaching me so much through this series so far, and, and, and I know that he'll do the same for you. So, so get on there. Check it out. Uh, God's going to teach you something. I know it. So before we officially begin, let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for uh, once more the opportunity to be here. God, to open your word, uh, to declare your word uh, to, to the people here, to your people. Uh, I pray that as I do that, God, that, that you would speak through me. God, the words that I don't need to say, help them to just leave my mind and not come out of my mouth. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts, open my heart this morning to what you'd have for us. God, help us to be encouraged uh, and to put into practice what we learn uh, from Daniel this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, it's great to be here this morning as God's people singing songs uh, of worship to God, uh, reading from his word, uh, praying for one another. I, I love it. I love being here. It, 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 it recharges me uh, for the week. And, and I, I just, man, if I didn't have church on a Sunday morning, I, I'd probably be a sadder person. But, but let me ask you a question. What if today were the last day that we were legally allowed to do this? What if tomorrow a law was passed by our government that Christianity, all Bibles, all Christian material, uh, everything was illegal? You had to go to the, to the local police station, to your council, and you had to turn in your Bible, your Christian materials, and if you didn't, they would come find you. What if following Jesus meant the choice between living or dying? Which would you choose? You know, thankfully, we live in a country that we're following Jesus isn't a crime, but, but as my family used to say, times, they are a-changing. Times, they are a-changing. In the United States, did you know that people have now been taken to court time and time again because they wouldn't do something uh, that that agree, or that, sorry, they wouldn't, let me read what I read, they wouldn't, they refuse to make cakes celebrating things they don't agree with. Um, in the UK, a woman was arrested and charged for silently praying outside an abortion clinic, for just praying. In Victoria, and coming soon to a, other Australian states near us, according to the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission website, it is against the law to try and change or suppress someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, even if they ask for help. In this church, did you know that people have been told, you need to give up this Jesus hobby thing, or else you're gone? What would you do? So what do we do as followers of Jesus in a world that's increasingly hostile to the things of God? What, what are we to do? How can we, God's people remain obedient to God when the world around them, when the world around us tells us just give it up? It's not worth it. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to turn to the book of Daniel today and we're going to find out. We're actually going to be picking up, I know uh, Justina read from chapter 6, but I believe that Really, it should have started at 531. The Hebrew Bible starts at 531. So let's quickly look at that. Uh, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, he's dead <laughs> in 530. In verse 531, it says, And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, who is Darius? Because you know, if you've heard me at all, you know I like to give a little background. Darius, the short answer is we're not 100% certain. Okay? People use this guy to 
to bash uh, Daniel, so I say it can't be real, uh, but, but I'm just telling you now up front, we're not certain, but scholars have, I got three theories that, it, they, that they may have, he, who he may have been. He may have been a co-regent ruling with Cyrus the Persian. I mean, he was 62, so maybe Cyrus, uh, he's been known to let other people rule with him. Uh, so maybe he was a co-regent, maybe he was, uh, maybe Darius uh, was the title of a lesser ruler over Babylon, appointed by Cyrus. Uh, did you know Belsha Belshazzar? He was uh, he's very similar. He was appointed under this guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he could have been a relative. I've read that he was the father-in-law of Cyrus, and he was just placed on the throne uh, of the Babylonian territory just for a while because, you know, Cyrus wanted to get in good with the, uh, with the in-laws. Uh, but whatever the case, Babylon is no more. Belshazzar is dead, and Darius the Mede is now ruling all that Babylon previously owned. Kind of reminds us of the, the statue prof prophecy from chapter 2. You remember that? The Lord told Nebuchadnezzar that his nation's time, uh, his rule was appointed to last only a little bit. And then a second kingdom, uh, the breast of arms, uh, or the, the breast and the arms of silver, would take over for Babylon. And now 66 years later, guess what? It's done. The prophecy fulfilled. We moved into the second stage of the statue's timeline. And the new ruler inherits uh, the kingdom of Babylon, including uh, and including Daniel. So let's check it out. Verse, verse 1, chapter 6. Daniel is promoted, all right? It says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, and with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Darius, he sets up this government structure probably to do what most governments do, collect taxes. Uh, you know, my dad used to say there's only two things certain in life, death and taxes. And here we got it. Uh, they're collecting taxes, and it helps me think, it, it may help you, I don't know, my, my mind works weird. It helps me to think of the satraps as kind of like our city mayors. Okay, these, these are our mayors, uh, and the administrators, they're like our premiers of the state. Okay, so that's kind of how I think of it. So Daniel, he's made uh, the leader uh, of, of the satraps, so probably a group of 40. So Daniel was like the premier. Okay, so Daniel's life is interesting because it seems to go through what I call from a zero to a hero. All right, so uh, let me explain. So zero to hero, I even made a little chart for you. So in chapter one, so how does he, he starts out as a zero, right? He's captured as a slave. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he decides he doesn't want to eat the king's meat. Uh, and then he becomes renowned for his wisdom and, and his understanding. He becomes a hero, zero to hero. In chapter two, what do we read? The king has a dream. He's going to kill everybody, all the wise men, because no one could interpret the dream, uh, <laughs> including Daniel. The king's like, I'm going to kill all of you. Daniel, you're included. So he's a zero then again. Uh, then with God's help, he becomes the hero. He interprets the dream, zero to hero. Chapter 4 and chapter 5, very similar, zero to hero. So, so here we have in chapter 6, Daniel, uh, he's gone from zero <laughs> back to hero again. He's promoted, and he's doing well in Darius' kingdom, and everything is going all right. All right, you know, like the old movie, It's Good to Be the King, kind of like Daniel's, like, it's good to be the administrator. You know, sometimes that happens in our life, right? We're the zeros. We're not going very well, not doing things. Uh, things in our life are going pretty bad, but all of a sudden, it's like a, a turn happens, and we become the hero. You know, we, we get the job. <laughs> we buy the house. We ace the test. We lose those five kilos. We get the girl. Everything is going well. And for Daniel, everything is going very well. Look at verse 3. So or Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over uh, the whole kingdom. Things are going really well for Daniel. Uh, we don't know what his good work was, but I bet we can imagine why he was doing so well. He, he's, Daniel's probably meticulous at rooting out fraud and corruption. He's probably pretty wise in his judgments, and he's in incorruptible in his rule. Uh, you know, where others might have taken bribes and, and got a little bit of money on the side from other people, Daniel doesn't. He serves the king faithfully. Uh, Daniel's work kind of reminds me uh, of Colossians chapter 3, 23. It says, whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So Daniel's doing that. He's working for the Lord, and the result is the Lord, or sorry, the king finds Daniel to be exceptional. Now, 
while the king is recognizing all this about Daniel, and it's a pretty good thing, right? Because Daniel's like, yes, I'm going to be in charge uh, of the kingdom except for the king. Uh, while, while the king is realizing this, all this time, guess what else is happening? The people that he's working, the other administrators, the people that he's working alongside of, that means that they're starting to get diminished in the eyes of the king. So Daniel is about to go from equal to enemy. His poppy's getting too tall. It needs to be cut down, right? And like the straight-A student that, ha- that blows the curve uh, on the test for the rest of the class, the other people start getting angry. They get mad. Check out verses 4 to 9. Daniel is tested. Daniel is tested. At this, uh, the administrators and the satraps try to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligence. Negligence, sorry. So he's, he's tested what I called worldly tested. I don't have it on the screen, but he's tested on earthly means. The government uh, officials, they hated the idea of Daniel ruling over them. So they start asking around. They're like, Psst, hey, Bob, you got any dirt on Daniel? And then Bob's like, no, nah, he's a good guy. And then they go to, you know, maybe they go to Phyllis. Hey, Phyllis, you got any dirt on Daniel? No, nah, he's pretty good. They, they, they start questioning his coworkers, his employees, his, his servants, his friends, anyone that is associated with Daniel to try to dig up some dirt on him. I mean, they check out his social media pages. Hey, anyone check his uh, Facebook page? Check his, uh, what, what do you got here? I don't even know what we have today. Uh, TikTok, and they checked his TikTok pages. Uh, they Googled his name or whatever they did back in the day. Maybe they put it on a piece of paper and I don't know. They Googled his name to see what came up, but nothing. There was not a single thing uh, that they could find against uh, Daniel. He was what the Bible calls blameless. Now, blameless, not just, it's not sinless, but blameless before men. They couldn't find anything that he was doing that was wrong. And that, that got me thinking, and it really challenged me. Could people say the same thing about you and me? You know, someone to ask around uh, at, at your work, at my work, and they were like, hey, can you tell me about this Josh guy? What do you reckon about him? What do you think his work ethic's like? What do you reckon they would find? What if they did that about you? What would they find? If someone looked at your browser history on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet, or whatever device you use to access the internet, what would they find? And could they use that to say, well, this person, look what they've been doing. How easily would we pass or would we fail the same test that Daniel had? Could we really say that we are doing everything with all of our heart, working for the Lord and not for human masters? I'm going to be honest. I've been guilty, man, when someone's like, clean the toilet in my past jobs. I didn't like that. I actually left a job once because someone said, I want you to keep cleaning. And I said, oh, that's enough. I don't, I, I'm not here for that. But I was not like Daniel. How about you? So since Daniel, he passed all their earthly tests, right? So they couldn't find anything up on him, uh, or uh, couldn't find anything wrong with what he was doing. They couldn't dig up any dirt on him. So then they choose the one thing that they know that they can think of. They, I, I call it spiritually tested. Finally, check it out in verse uh, number five. It says, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Does that sound familiar to you? You know, people also couldn't find any fault with Jesus. They looked and they looked at his life just like they looked at Daniel. Nothing. You know how they found fault with him? They found fault with him by misinterpreting the law of God. Oh, well, this guy does this. But it was in misinterpretations. It was their own thinking. Uh, very similar. Uh, so let's keep going. Chapter, uh, verse 6. So the administrators and all the satraps went as the group to the king and said, Oh, King Darius... Live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict enforce the law, and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree, de- issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king, uh, so king Darius put the decree in writing. So notice, again, the, the government officials, they conspire to trick the king 
uh, into creating a law they know Daniel wouldn't obey. You see, they didn't care about anyone else. They only cared about Daniel at this point. They hated him. They wanted to get him out of there. So they thought of one law, one law that we could call this Daniel's law. They wanted one law they came up with that they know that they knew Daniel uh, wouldn't obey. And, and to me, I was thinking, isn't it interesting how easily tricked the king was? Uh, I mean, he even says, hey, these laws can't be repealed. And why did they do that? It was kind of like a, a check, uh, you know, check and balance of the king's power. So the king had to think, do I really want to pass this law? Because if I pass this law, it can't be repealed. I have to obey the law. Mm. Uh, he doesn't think about any of that. They, they trick him. Uh, the officials use <laughs> uh, what I call the everyone agrees with us fallacy. Uh, there's a Latin name, but I you know, thought it was a bit snooty to say it. So I just said, everyone agrees with us fallacy. Here's, they, they come to the king. Oh, king, we've spoken to everyone. Well, remember, they didn't speak to Daniel. Uh, and they all agree, O oh, king, and they, you know, whatever, they're bowing to him. But still, they didn't speak to Daniel. We all agree, everybody agrees. I've talked to my dog, he agrees that everyone should, we should all make this new law, O oh, king, and this law is going to be great. Are you ready for it? Listen, king, this law is going to be amazing. This law will say that everyone should pray only to you for the next 30 days. And all the guys probably look at each other, and they look at the king, and and then someone pipes up, isn't that great? And they're all like, yes, they cheer. I can imagine it in my head. And then one guy's like, man, that's awesome. Uh, and then <laughs> and if they don't, they say, they tell the king, if they don't, you know, maybe they kind of mumble it under their breath. If they don't, we'll throw them in the lion's den. You know, uh, we'll throw them into the lion's den, they say. And the king's kind of sitting there thinking, hmm, the lion's den. And then someone yells out, simply all inspiring your majesty, right? I can't believe you came up with that. Just sign right here on this wall. will be permanent. And the king, you know, they like, here's a prepared one that I had earlier. Uh, you see, they came up with this law, and I think the law, it, uh, how they came up with it, 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 it was two ways. Firstly, they appealed to the king's pride. You know, you want to get something done, appeal to someone's pride. You know, they, they, they talked up the king. Oh, king, live forever. Oh, your majesty, you are so great. You are the king of kings and lord of lords. And whatever they're saying to him, they, they're appealing to his pride. And as he's sitting there listening, probably on his throne, maybe gave, they gave him something nice and cool to drink, he starts thinking, man, these guys are right. I am awesome. I think everyone should pray to me. Let, let me sign that. They appealed to his pride. Second, and this is kind of why I think it was easier to trick him as well, the law kind of makes sense because it was a test of loyalty to the king. You know, not only did they appeal to pride, they, they, they said, hey, look, we're going to test people's loyalty to you. I mean, in the way, the king was meant to be like a god back then. So if people didn't pray to him, well, that, that meant they were kind of being disloyal to the king. And so the king said, hmm, I'm pretty amazing. And I know that this will test people's loyalty to me. Where do I sign? Where do I sign? Uh, notice how similar this is to, to chapter 3 of Daniel. You know, there, King Nebuchadnezzar, who's basically like, bow down or burn, uh, worship my statue <laughs> or, uh, or else, where here it's, you either pray to me or perish. You shall not pray in the king's law. You shall not pray to anyone or anything but the king. So the pressure's on for Daniel. The test is made. What's he going to do? Now, I, I do find it interesting here that, that Daniel's being tested. I mean, when you look up the, the pictures of, of on the internet, I was, I'll show you some later, but you search up pictures. A lot of times I, I always remember seeing Daniel as like a little kid. And I'm thinking, why is he being tested? I mean, when you look up how old he really is, he's like 80 years old at this time. I mean, hasn't he been enough, have passed enough tests in his life uh, to prove that he's loyal to God? I, and it just kind of gets me thinking, it, it doesn't matter whether you're eight or whether you're 18 or whether you're 80, we have an enemy that the Bible says is the accusers of our brothers and sisters, and that he accuses them day and night before God. Just because you've chosen to follow Jesus doesn't mean you've moved uh, your life to easy street. If you thought that, oh, sorry, I'm bursting your bubble, that is not the case. The opposite is true. Check out what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
doesn't say that you may be persecuted. doesn't say that, oh, you, you know, that's just me, but you, you're going to be all right. He says, you will be persecuted. If you're following Jesus here today, your test is coming. It's just a matter of when. Now, if that scares you and you're like, oh, I don't know if I sign. Someone told me Jesus is, following Jesus is going to be awesome and no, no bad things will ever happen to me. If that scares you, well, listen to what the one who's worthy of your following says in John chapter 16. He says, I have told you these things. This is Jesus speaking. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You know, in this world you will have trouble, but, but take heart. I have overcome the world. What's the worst thing that could happen to us in this world? We could be killed. We could be killed. But as a follower of Jesus, what does that mean? You're killed on the earth one day. Guess where you're going the instant you're dead? You're going to be with Jesus forever in a paradise. No real contest. Uh, but what did Daniel do? Check it out. Verses 10 to 12. Daniel prays. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. See, when the law is made public, Daniel goes home. He walks upstairs to a room where the window is open and it faces towards Jerusalem. He gets down on his knees and he prays just as he had done before. And I read this passage to my family and and, and I told them that I was speaking about Daniel this morning, and my son, I love my son, he's 10, he pipes up and he says, well, why didn't Daniel just close the window? And I'm like, no. Or he even, then I was like, well, you know, I was kind of at a loss, and he's like, well, why didn't he just pray somewhere else? Like, why did he have to pray in front of the window? And, and couldn't he just pray, like, you know, stand? You don't even have to close your eyes to pray. Couldn't he have done all that kind of thing? And I said, of course he could pray with the windows shut. But you see, and this is the bottom line uh, for, for our morning today, you see, Daniel resolved to be obedient to God no matter the consequences. Resolved to obedience. Daniel resolved to be obedient to God no matter the consequences. I, I, I really believe that if Daniel would have changed his habits now, it would have been paramount to, a, to denying God for those 30 days. You know, everyone knew what he was doing. Everyone knew he talked to God at these three times a day. Everyone knew where he did it. If he would have changed, they would have been like, we got him. We got him. He doesn't worship really the, the real God. He's just doing it out of convenience. So he didn't change. He kept on praying just as he had done before, and he disobeyed the law, and he was ready for the consequences. You know, how easy is, is it for us as followers of Jesus to change? Uh, just so that we might fit in with everyone around us. You, uh, think about it. Don't pray here, we're told, and so we don't. Don't talk to people about Jesus there, and so we don't. Uh, keep your Christianity to yourself, and so we do. We must be resolved like Daniel to be obedient to God no matter the consequences. When I was a youth pastor in Victoria, I was able to start this lunchtime uh, program at one of the local high schools there. It was one of the bigger, bigger schools. Uh, and, and basically the goal was simply to connect students with Jesus. All right? That was our goal, to connect students with Jesus. The program involved some crazy games that the kids loved, uh, and then we talked about Jesus. Um, the, the students were able to come and go, so it wasn't like I was locking them in. They were coming to go as they pleased during the program. I even told them, I had to tell them, hey, I'm talking about God now. If you need to leave, I understand. You can go ahead and go. Uh, we probably averaged somewhere about 90 students during the lunchtime program. In one classroom, it was crazy. 90 teenagers for a few weeks. And then I got a message from the chaplain. He, he called me up and he said, hey, someone's complained. And I said, what do you mean they complained? He said, uh, he said someone's complained about you talking about God. And so the school has told me, hey, you can come in, you can run the program as much as you want, but you cannot mention Jesus you cannot mention God anymore. You can't even mention anything to do with your church. What should I do? Should I still talk about God? That's the question that was coming into my head at the moment. And let me move it a little closer to home. What if your workplace banned you from talking about Jesus? What would you do? What if they said you're not even allowed to pray? Not at meals, not at not at your desk. If we catch you, you're gone. What would you do? 
What do you think Daniel would have done? Well, we know what he would have, we know what Daniel would do. Daniel would have resolved to be obedient to God no matter the consequences. What would you do? Verse 11 says, Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying, and they asked, asking God for help. So they went to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays any gods or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? Well, the king answered, Well, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Inevitably, probably the same day the law was published, <laughs> the men, they go and they find Daniel praying. Uh, and they come back to the king. I, I like that part. They come back to the king and they say, Hey, didn't you say? And he's like, well, you know, uh, of course I said that. Uh, didn't you say that if someone doesn't pr praise to someone else other than you, they're cat chow? Well, he's like, yeah, well, you know the law. Verse 13, and they said to the king, well, Daniel, who was one of the exiles, by the way, they're, they're, not, they're not commending him here. They're actually insulting him. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed, and he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. You see, the king, it's like one of those movie moments where the king just realizes, uh-oh, the joke's on me. I I've been duped. I've been tricked. Uh, he's been tricked into condemning his most trusted advisor, <laughs> and he's greatly distressed about the situation. Again, notice the difference between chapter 3 uh, and here. In, in chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar is told, hey, these guys aren't going to bow down to you, he doesn't get, ups he doesn't get distressed. He gets upset. And, you know, he, he orders the furnace turned up to 11. He's like, get it hotter. Uh, but Darius is distressed, and he's trying to save Daniel, and he's doing everything he can to save him. Look at verse 15. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. So the king realizes that he's done all he could do. He's tried all he could to help Daniel. And he does something I find quite unexpected here. Uh, in chapter 3, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they make uh, that awesome statement about worshiping the statue, whether they're thrown, they're not going to worship the statue, whether they're thrown into the fire or not. And, and here I'm expecting Daniel to do the same thing. Man, I want Daniel to be like, oh, king, you could throw me in the lion's den. Uh, and, and I'm not going to pray to anyone but, but the true living God. But it, it's kind of crazy in the fact that it's the king who gives voice to a, a prayer that we would expect Daniel to be saying. It's the king who says, may the God whom you continually serve rescue you. It's like he's praying. And what's crazier still is that God is going to answer uh, Darius's prayer for Daniel. Now, I was thinking about what did that tell the Israelites at the time uh, of this book's writing? Why was that even included in there? What is that... What does that tell us today? Well, I think God put that little detail uh, in this passage for a reason. You see, God is showing that even the most powerful thing in our world, money, the king had all the money that he could want, uh, or even the most powerful king in the mightiest nation cannot save you from death. The king couldn't do anything. Daniel could only be saved by the king who was above every other king and the Lord who was above every other Lord, uh, Jehovah God. And so Daniel was punished for his obedience to God. And the king is worried. Look at verse 17. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and, or signet ring and the, with the rings of his nobles. And so da that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without ent entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. And now the scene that's inspired a, a, a thousand kids coloring books, uh, verses 19 to 24, Daniel protected. Uh, check out the next slide. There you go. This is what we often think of. Uh, it said, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? I'm sure he waited there for a second. Maybe Daniel was messing with him. I would have messed with him. Uh, quiet. Um, 
But Daniel's probably not like me. Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, O king. Now, does this scene remind you of something? A place of death located in the ground? A stone placed on its entrance, sealed with a seal? Someone coming to the tomb at first light? Anyone? What do you reckon? Yeah, Jesus? Kind of reminds me of Jesus. Uh, Well done if you thought that. Well, it's amazing that even here we find traces of God's hand pointing us to his son. It's coming in the future. You see, the Lord alone saves Daniel. Notice the Bible says that that God shut the mouths of the lions. The lions weren't like the picture and they were sleepy and Daniel was cuddling up with them and patting them. No, no, no. They were lions. (laughs) Daniel didn't, (laughs) like I said, Daniel wasn't friendly with them. Daniel was probably hiding in the corner. Uh, afraid that at any moment they were going to eat him. They, they, the Lord was supernaturally stopping them from eating Daniel. Uh, if he wouldn't have, they would have munched him up in a moment. Uh, and so he's there, probably praying the whole night. Chapter, or, sorry, verse 23, I think is where we're at. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted God. Here ends the kid's story, right? This is where we stop with our kids, where the Bible doesn't end there. Check out verse 24. At the king's command, this is why I'm saying that God supernaturally shut their mouths. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Add that to your kid's story at night. See what happens. No, maybe not. Don't do that. Um... (laughs) You may be thinking, and I was thinking this too, man, that's brutal. Why did the wives and the kids get killed too? What did, what did they do? Well, a couple of things. They, they did that way back then. Uh, they, 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 they punished the whole family, usually as a way to, to prevent uh, revenge killings uh, later on for when the kids grew up. Uh, they didn't want, the king didn't want anyone coming back trying to kill him. The second thing uh, is, was why did they do that? The man was the head of the family back then. And so, as the man goes, so goes the family. So the man was killed, so goes the family. And, and to a lesser extent, isn't that true today for us? As the leader of the home goes, so goes the home. Uh, is, if the father's bad with money, guess who suffers? The family. Uh, if the mother does something that is, is wrong, uh, uh, guess who suffers? The family. If the children rebel guess who suffers the family these aren't necessarily consequences from from god but they're natural consequences of sin as the leaders of the family go so goes the family let's finish up god's praise verses 25 to 28 then king darius wrote to all the peoples nations and men of every language throughout the land May, your God, or may you prosper greatly. I, ha, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Now King Darius realized that, that, that Daniel's God is the God to be feared and honored. Now, does this mean that he became a follower of Jehovah God, of Yahweh? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is follower of God or not, God is praised. And and, and it finishes up with verse 28. Uh, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So you see, Daniel resolved to be obedient to God, no matter the consequences, and he ended up prospering. Could I wish that that was a recipe for us? Does it always work out that way as followers of Jesus? That you stand firm and everything works out and you prosper? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Just because you follow Christ, it doesn't mean that you won't be tried or tested. You may not get the job. You may lose that friend. You may get sick. You know, following Jesus doesn't get you a a get out of persecution or problems card. It, It doesn't mean you'll triumph over your enemies on earth. In fact, you may never, ever prosper on earth like Daniel, but one day, one day God will make everything right. One day you will prosper. But here's the question. 
Will you be like Daniel and resolve to obey God even if things don't work out for you? If our world becomes our enemy, will you go, still go to your room and pray? Will you stand for Jesus even if you have to do it alone? Will you, be follow, will you follow God no matter the consequences? Let me encourage you today. Start. Start while it's easier. Start while there's not the threat of death hanging over you. Daniel in the lion's den isn't just a story we read to our kids. It's a story for you and me. A story that shows us that we can be resolved to be obedient to God no matter the consequences. What's the worst that could happen? You go to heaven. That's a pretty good uh, outcome to me. Obviously, your family will miss you. I'm not making a lot of anything. But think about that. If you follow Jesus, will you stand for him? No matter the consequences. Let's pray. Father, wow. I feel like this has been a fast and furious uh, talk on Daniel chapter 6. But man, in the midst of all the, the verses, in the midst of everything that's there, may we remember, God, that, that you were sovereign. God, you're in control of all things. And uh, you put this, this story in the Bible, this passage in the Bible for us today. Because you knew that at this time in our lives that, that things were going to start getting tougher. And God, you want us to resolve to be obedient to you no matter the consequences. And so I pray that for myself this morning. I pray that for every person in this room, God, that we would go out of here. We would share your word. Uh, we would share your love with others, God, whether they, uh, we lose that friendship or not. But I, I'm not saying I want us to be martyrs, and I'm not saying that I want us to be uh, people that are seeking trouble. But God, if you open our Hearts, if you open the way, help us to follow you, be obedient to you, and to share what you want us to share. Help us to be wise, as you say, wise as serpent and harmless as doves. In Jesus' name, amen.